Hi, welcome to our brand new podcast here at Connors Music. It's How To Underscore Music. Uh, I'm Joe Connors. This is my brother Dave Connors. Uh, and the two of us are going to uh, carry you on a journey through music this week and, and moving forward. Uh, yeah. We're looking to do this about monthly. Yeah, that's the plan. We're going to air one a month on the second Thursday of every month to start. And, you know, as we get things rolling, maybe that'll evolve to more. But that's that's the starting point. Yeah. Uh, this week's topic, we're talking about how to learn music. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, it was a really neat topic to start with as Connor's Music, we're a music store that has been focused around lots of different aspects about music, but definitely teaching has been a, a main principle since 1978 when Big Daddy P opened up the shop here in Keswick. So uh, right out of the gate, we're going to ask that you like and subscribe our YouTube channel. That way you can keep up to date for when we drop the latest how to underscore music. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So uh, Ryan, our producer, who's a staff member here, we want to thank him for running this and putting all the mechanics together for the uh, technical side. Uh, so you may hear from him throughout the uh, podcast as we chat, because if he has something good to say, he's going to chime in with something good to say. So yeah, and I, I, there is wisdom to be had there. Absolutely, from Ryan. Yes. Well, yeah. and I mean that's a good point. I think that every step of the way. There's something to be learned from that person, whether it's a six-year-old learning music. Me as a professional can learn something from that six-year-old. 100%. And um, and then uh, conversely, somebody who's far more advanced than me has something to teach me and they have something to learn from me. So it's a language and uh, and it's well, a language that... And that's that, a huge, like music is a language. And, and yeah. we say that because that's ingrained in both of us as the way we've learned it, the way we've Absolutely. discussed it. Yeah. But that might be a new topic or a new thought for people at home. The for idea sure. that, that we, as an, as an instructor, we talk about trying to learn music the same way you learn a language. Uh, we grew up speaking English. We were an English-speaking yeah. household. I know Canada's bilingual, a little bit of French, a little bit of telefrancais, yeah. but, um, you know, telefrancais. <laughs> Um, but we ultimately, we learned English through immersion. We, yes. we were immersed in it. I would argue, I think you might agree, we learned music the same way. Absolutely. Growing up in a household that had musical instruments laying around and a music store in the basement, or, well, in the lower level of the home. I mean, I didn't have to choose to learn music. I just walked down there and picked something up and made, made sounds with it and turned that into music and then learned to get music out of anything. You know, that that's kind of the evolution of that. Um, versus being just a bass player, like right. I often like to refer to myself as. Um, I'm a musician, and whether you know I'm singing or I'm playing an instrument or wherever, there's music to be found. So, And there's uh, wisdom about the language of music, regardless of who you're talking to. You can discuss music at large with, Absolutely. with just about anybody. Well, and I believe it's the most universal language on the planet. You know, like often English is toted as the most universal that everyone speaks their foreign the, the language. The language of business. Some English, it's the language right. of business. But you don't need to know the language of music to understand the language of music, which is an interesting thought process because anyone can listen to music and be moved by it and can experience that and can feel something from that. Right. So I find it really intriguing that... Um, someone who only speaks German or, or France, French or whatever can play music and I can feel what they're trying to express to me. I can, I can understand their story through the music without knowing how to play the music. Right. So that's where we talk about the listener, but then we talk all the way about to the, to the musician, the player that, right. that's presenting that language to the listener, right? So... Um, and I think that's where the journey needs to start, where is um, you start to listen to the, the language of music, and then you're inspired to want to share your language through music, and then you, you find a way to start learning it. Well, and, and you're learning it through immersion, you're learning it through speaking it with, with professionals, um, and uh, the best... And, and with your peers. And with your peers, absolutely. That's, that's a big part so of it, too. So I'll tell my story a little bit. Okay, yeah, please. Uh, my origin story if you will. So when I was six... <laughs> Sounds like you're a superhero or a super villain. I could be both. <laughs> it depends on the day. Uh, when I was six, I was taking formal guitar lessons in that music shop. 
right? And I didn't like it. I didn't want to practice. I just, just, I was like forced to it. It felt, right? And one day I said, dad, I don't want to practice this. And dad's like, you don't have to. I was like, oh, really? He's like, you just, you don't have to play music. I was like, really? I don't? No. He's like, if you want to play music, then you need to work on it. But if you don't want to, then quit. Like, oh, okay. Uh, I quit. <laughs> so then I started playing lots of sports and not playing say, any music. Lots of hockey, lots of goalie. Lots of hockey, yeah. Ball hockey, ice hockey, football, baseball, anything. Anything athletic, rollerblading. And then uh, at about the age of 10, John, brother John was uh, downstairs jamming with Matt Malloy and Adam Malloy. And the three of them were jamming. And I heard that and I was like, whoa, what's going on downstairs? That sounds cool. So I went down there and I was like, hey, that, I'd like to do that. Not this formal book work. I want, I want to do this. I want to speak the language now because I loved listening to music. So dad said, oh yeah, well, we need a bass player. And the classic bass player story classic, is- we need a bass player. We need a bass player. And uh, I'm the guy who doesn't know anything. So give him a bass, you know? <laughs> yeah, for anyone at and, home uh, uh, who wants to join a band but doesn't know where to start, know that bass players are gold. They're platinum. Yeah. You, yeah. Will, you will have A job. Work. You will always have work <laughs> if you're a bass player. So I end up going in and we're working on Crowbar, Oh, What a Feeling. And I'm and like, that's like your first. Oh yeah, that's I'll like just the space right So dad's a do boom, 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 boom. Okay, I get it. No, but that day I got it. Okay, right. I can do this. So then we add another song and another song, and I learned the riff or the bass line, right? And that's it. And dad's like, well, I didn't even want to know the note names. I, I didn't care. It was just where do I put my hand and how do I make it sound cool? Okay, great. So then that evolves and the band gets better and they start writing songs. Now you got to know note names, you know, you got to know how to build a bass line. And so I start emulating some of the bass players. I love that at the time, guys like Flea and stuff. And I'm just working on technique and speaking the language and trying to do my best to avoid learning any of the grammar, any of the structure. Right. Again, back you know? to music as a language, the same way, you know, you study that you know how to build a proper sentence, your nouns, your verbs, adverbs, etc. Absolutely, right? And spelling. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then, hundred percent. We have to do that with music eventually, but you didn't. You they, don't have to. No, you don't have to, and yeah. that's that's important to. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of successful musicians yeah. out there who, you know, I had a bandmate for years, uh, or years ago, who he didn't know the names of his guitar chords. Yeah. And he just like this is this is guitar one. It's guitar, guitar chord two. Yeah, it sounds cool, and I do it like right. this. Yeah. What was amazing was years later for him on his journey after that stage where he could play well, he just didn't know what the heck he was playing. Yeah. He then later on was inspired to study further and then yeah. come back around to, and, well, and that's the, the part of the journey that we all get to I eventually. Think for every musician, us, even oh. if you think about Flea's story, I, I'm pretty sure he went on to study trumpet gonna, yeah. at university of berkeley or something like yeah, yeah. that right because quite, quite the trumpeter you, you get trumpeter i like that yeah. um you you get to a point where you hit a roadblock and and to get past that level and get to the next level of music you're trying to achieve suddenly you need some information that that you may not have so yeah. up until this point, you know, I'm I'm going online as that evolved. I, oh yeah, you know, like wasn't online. A, you're you're talking about like a little ping, bit of YouTube, ping, yeah, ping. dial up YouTube, right? Yeah, yeah 28 um, modem. Classic. <laughs> and uh, going to jams, uh, playing with friends that play music, and maybe they know more than me, maybe they know less, but we're jamming. The family, you know, like going down and jam with my brothers and my parents, and and I, I'm gonna bring it back to that oh. point. Yeah. That was an important day for Twelve. me. So at 12. Yeah. Hit your 12. Though. Church. Yes. choir, Church choir became yeah. a thing. And suddenly there was a, a chart in front of me. <laughs> with with notes. With notes yeah. and chords, chords and, and measures and repeats. And now and I need to know what a G is, right? right. Yeah. So, and... so that, that two-year window evolved into suddenly there's like, a, whoa, what's going on here? It's, it's amazing the amount of people I've talked to who, um, students, uh, fellow musicians, um, and there's a great quote in Alan Doyle's book, um, uh, one, his autobiography, where he talks about, you know, that point, you know, uh, as a musician where volunteering your services at, at church. And that's, you know, your journey of faith. That's you know, I'll leave that aside for a sec. But just in the musician concept yeah. that if you if you volunteer your time and your talents to something community like volunteering at church and you end up having 
you know, through learning worship music, that um, study of the craft. Yeah. And you, there is great wealth as a musician. And then, hey, if there's a peripheral bonus to your spiritual life, I'd, yeah. I'd encourage that. Absolutely. But, um, but it's, uh, yeah, it, from the musician craft. And he was talking about some of the tools and tricks that he learned from doing that in his book. Yeah, where... And some of the greatest singers that are pop singers and stuff started in church choirs, you know. Right. Um, it's it's interesting. For, for a lot of people, it's their first exposure to music too, right? Like, totally. You yeah. Know, so. And because you're not just doing it by yourself and you're not just making it up, suddenly there's structure. structure. And whenever you're part of kind of a structured system, um, now you kind of got to learn the rules a little bit. And, and and I think, you know, a formal uh, religion is a, a great place for uh, learning to read and learning to uh, socialize and learning to, like, it, 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 all the facets of life are kind of laid out as part of that community, which is interesting. And, and the music community within that is where a lot of great musicians are certainly are born, if you will. Yeah, there's there's definitely a vehicle for that. Through mm-hmm. that. Yeah. And, uh, so, uh, anyway, yeah, you know, self-taught. Now yeah. we're playing at church choir with dad and mom and uh, 50 other people singing, you yeah. know, and trying to play bass there and not... not in front, and in front of an audience. 12, yeah. At age 12, in front of an audience and yeah. being like, well... Uh, here I am going to do this. And, and, you know, uh, I don't know, I'd say as an instructor, I find more and more students come to me of all ages where there's, there's a lot of apprehension. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of anxiety. And, and what if I don't do it right? What if I, you know, and, and I don't, I don't think like that always existed. Yeah. But I, but that whole, uh, you know, rising to a challenge and then saying, you know, if you can put your, basically the gist of what I'm getting at is if you can overcome that, moment of of fear about you know making a mistake yeah. in front of people my um i had a, a a big moment for that in grade nine at uh going to cardinal carter high school yeah and playing for music uh, again for a a, a mass yeah right? so playing for a, a you know for church um for a school assembly and i had to play guitar for a part and i had said i could do it and i said i could do it and it was in front of an audience of you know, you know, a congregation School. of a thousand people it broke up into two assemblies. Well, that triple gymnasium. Yeah, it was yeah. A ma- so yeah. Th- there I am doing my little finger picking guitar part for Paco Bell's Canon, and uh, and I I flub flub hard, mm. and my face goes beet red. And there I'm watching everybody come and walk past as they're leaving, and they're all looking at me like, and I'm trying to play this piece, and I'm having a horrendous time doing it. Yeah, and there's one of two options that could have happened that day. I could have said, okay, well, I'll never want to do that again. Hang right. up the guitar and walk away. Uh, and if that was the case, maybe that that's the case. But ultimately, that was a teachable moment. And I ended up, you know, as a, as overcoming that in future, I then was ready for the next time I made a mistake on stage. And I think any pro musician will will be quick to admit we make mistakes on stage every show. Yeah, every sh- you know, yeah. Some some of us more than others, but the trick is is being yeah. able to to cover it up and, and yeah, play and through play it. Through. Well, and uh, you know, uh, <laughs> most mistakes if you do them twice start to sound like you meant them. Right. So I mean, just throw that just out. Just do there. it again. Yeah. Right. Then it's it, jazz. It is, <laughs> yeah. Um. So I think part of the learning process is finding if I'm going to bring that full circle back is finding those opportunities to put yourself out there as best you can challenge yourself challenge yeah. yourself and, yeah. and that could mean you know volunteering to to play at a school assembly uh, with your your local church or some sort of community event an open mic night a jam mm-hmm. right? uh, putting yourself out there to invite others to play with yeah because music i i always think music is best shared yes right? it's, absolutely you know, there's a lot of people who play solo and that's amazing there's but they some, still share it with somebody yeah but if I mean, you just like, buy yourself wood shedding and you never take it anywhere, I mean, that's a... It could be cathartic. It could yeah, be for you. No, it could be good. like the equivalent of somebody who like at home paints and never wants to share those paintings with anybody. But it's even like them. if your mom heard you through the floorboards doing it, that she would be moved and inspired. Like you got to share that. Share right. that. Eventually share that. Yeah. As soon as you're comfortable to. And, yeah. And, but there's also a lot of growth with that. And every, yeah. every experience gives you an opportunity to build off of it. And, and grow. And I think that's yeah. a big part of learning music is finding those opportunities to play with others, play in front of others, yeah. right? And and finding those different opportunities to share. And yeah. put yourself into scenarios where, get uncomfortable. Yeah. If, if Every time you get uncomfortable, 
you're you're gonna you know obviously you don't want to make yourself too uncomfortable yeah you know, don't bite off way more than you can chew but every yeah. time that you stretch yourself a little bit you're going to uh increase the number of tools in your toolkit as a musician right you're gonna have more experiences to draw from well you know i was listening to a different podcast with um jordan peterson and he was talking about this idea that um when you have a fear that you can't overcome the only way to to get through that is to expose yourself voluntarily to it to a certain amount that you're comfortable with, you'll still be terrified. But the more you voluntarily expose yourself to that fear, the more you'll be able to handle it. It doesn't mean it goes away, but it means you can handle it. And I think learning music, that can relate so much to learning music because right. it's so easy to get comfortable with your pentatonic riff. Right. And, and then go solo at jams and only play in the key of E and only use the E minor pentatonic riff and literally wear the frets out on your guitar right. doing that. And I've right. being a guitar tech, I've seen it where I pick mm -hmm. up a guy's guitar Repairs and I'm like, come in. this guy can only play, or girl, guy or girl, can only play in the key of E minor. I can see it on the fretboard. Like right. you can literally chart it out and be like, wow, this guy never plays you in another see. key. Exactly where the wear and tear is yeah. on it from repetitive so playing. So that's somebody hey, credit, though, at that time. They're playing so much. They're playing so much, but they <laughs> also have chosen not to push themselves past their comfort zone. Right. So then you can see when they when they just push themselves to even just a different key signature or or something, it just expands everything they can do. So right. uh, let me try and refocus back to where I was. So in my timeline, so great. Uh, yeah, so we're church. Play, yeah, and you playing with uh, this would have been playing the in the band precursor of M MTC. It, was, it had evolved into MTC about the same time. Yeah, because the Malloys, Tracys, and the Connors were all part of the choir. Right. So it was all starting to culminate into the first band and the first album we record. And at this point, my my structure and theory is very minimal. I know the fingerboard, basically enough of the notes that I can read a chart and uh, not sight read a s notation, just read like a G chord and find a G. Read, like, read the guitar chord charts at the top and be able to apply that to the bass Not guitar. even that much. Literally right. see that it said G chord or G minor and, and know that I play G, you know, right. at that point. And then noodle with it that sounds cool and then people are like you're great and it's like thanks man but i don't really know what i'm doing but i'm having a great time doing it um that's important actually remind me to come back to that thought after this because anthony wellington talked about the four levels of, of awareness of music and, and i so ryan can you remind us to come back to that topic because hey, i got the memory span of a gnat to. Okay, okay good i'll get right on that perfect beautiful thanks, <laughs> make a note okay, okay. continue so um, now I start high school, like, a, like I kind of get all the way through grade school. Oh, one other thought you had said that I wanted to touch on was, uh, uh, and challenging those fears. The first time I performed, I was in grade one at St. Thomas Aquinas, and I played Silent Night for the Christmas concert on guitar in right. front of the whole gym and the whole school and did it well, well enough that people clapped. So that's good. But I mean, you're in grade one, so... It might not have been that well. I, I would love to see the heckler at the grade one. And at that, concert. yeah, at I'd that age, that though, like for like, <laughs> I'm going to be 40 this year. Not every parent there, no parents had a camera, you know. Right now, you go to that. There would be 5,000 versions of that online, and probably memes about it. You know, <sighs> it's all over the internet. But we just got to live our life I, I, and have a memory that's really amazing. I think I was amazing that day. So even though I hated it, I was like, oh, man, I'm playing guitar. But but it sounded amazing to the it, classical guitar in front of the whole gym. Not plugged in, not mic'd, I don't think. I mean, how did the gym hear? I don't even know. But, you know, in my mind, it was brilliance, you know. <laughs> I don't have to relive it as, as not. And then being a hockey player on the stage of the rink yeah. and in uh, soccer, and I constantly was in front of people doing stuff. So I never... I never had that same fear. I remember one show with, with, with guitar, John and I were doing a duet and he was playing piano and it was the song I Love Soccer at the Leacock Theater. This was your first performance no, at the Stephen Leacock Theater? At the Theater. Leacock Theater, yeah. So I was yeah. six-ish and it was a recital. And I was that was the first time I remember being nervous. Like I'm like, oh, I don't want to do this. And it was just I was afraid to make a mistake. And Mark Kranchak at the time, my guitar teacher, he said, Dave, now I realize it's a bit of a lie, but at the time he said, Dave, only you and I know how this song's supposed to sound. 
Now it's a duet, so John, my brother, also knew how it was supposed to sound. No, but that line, but, I, I, yeah. But I just, how it's supposed to be. So if you make a mistake, just keep playing. The audience won't know. And right. I was like, hmm. And in that moment, I applied that to everything in my life, including schoolwork and exams and essays and <laughs> everything. I just did it. And if you don't know how this is supposed to be, you don't know how my poem's supposed to sound. Right. You don't know how this math <laughs> equation's supposed to look. You don't know how this house is supposed to look that I'm now building as a carpenter. Right. You know, I just went ahead with <laughs> without fear. To all people who have yeah. their houses that were built by Dave and that, no, that, they were amazing houses. They, are, but, they were. But Very anyway, good contracting work. So I will attest. So that anyways. was that that performance <laughs> where where I learned to get over my fear real quick. That moment, and I was like, oh, cool. Yeah. And and so playing at church wasn't fearful. And playing in front of audiences wasn't fearful, really. Um, bass players get to kind of hide in the shadows anyway. So once I switched to bass, I, I never had to stand front and center. But anyways, really, unless I wanted to. I could choose right. to. So you take a bass solo. We've got, so anyway, so we've getting got over the fear. we some, some pretty ripping bass solos on yeah. here yeah. Uh, in your catalog of yeah. experience. Still not great footage, you know, with the age I'm at. Like tons of video footage. There's like one camera. Shake from cam like from an audience at yeah, a, where you're like, oh, Fair do you have that footage? Oh, I don't Mariposa. know where it is. I think it's on a hard drive somewhere. Wow. You know, now everything's online. But anyways, so now I'm in high school, and I still don't know any grammar on the on the music in the right? language of in music. the language of music. I'm right. I'm still faking it, and because my family owns a music store, and my brother John was really good at the language, and he got to Carter first. They skipped me from grade nine music into grade 10 music when I was in grade nine. I had to walk into a grade 10 music class with my bass guitar and them all expect that I know all the basics of grade nine music perfectly because I own a music, my family owns a music store and I should know all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yeah, sit down in the back of the class like, yeah, I don't have a clue, right? So I fudge my way through all of high school music with honors, still not being able to sight read anything still not understanding keys structure nothing we had to do a writing exercise and i figured out with a little bit of help from my dad how to chart out what i'd played and it was like in 12 8 time and it was crazy slap bass riff and we got it all charted out and i had to present that as like my final project and my teacher couldn't even sight read it it was so complicated i wasn't sight reading it i just memorized it and it was bah, 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 bah. right so it was kind of like just fudging my way along. So I graduate high school music with honors and still can't even sight read a note. Right. Without going, good basses do, and my pencil underneath. Oh, D. Oh, wait, finish that off. Good basses do. Oh, I don't know. No, <laughs> fine always. Yeah. Do and, fine always? Yeah. Oh, cool. I like that. I always use good bassists deserve fudge always. That way there's this like yeah. fudge lineage. I was trying to keep it low fudge. calorie. <laughs> right, that's good. You know what? We should consider a But then I say option. all cars eat gas or all right. cows Which eat. Which isn't the case anymore, Or all right? cows eat grass. That one works. Also not but, the case. Yeah. All lies. Everything you've ever yeah. learned. Grain-fed cows. Oh my goodness. Anyway, <laughs> back on it. So anyways, so that's how I, I fudged my way all the way through that that program and, and with honors, like 90%, like, right. oh yeah. Your, your ears and your hands. Speaking the language was what got me along. Right. So then I graduate that and dad's like, hey, you want to teach bass guitar? Well, you're really good. You're at the shop. Yeah. I guess he didn't really realize I couldn't sight read either. So You were that good. I was that good at faking it. So then I really quickly had to learn. So I got Hal Leonard book one. And I start on page one. And now been you at 19. It, yeah. And you've, and you've performed on TV at this point. You've yeah. performed at stages. Oh, all I over forgot the about grade six, the whole St. Thomas Saints, Saints with uh, Tony Perry. Yeah. And yeah. like I've been playing in multiple bands. You guys had I'd, a touring I, I had an band. album. I had recorded You'd an record, album. When you, the the I mean, accomplishments had piled up, but. Yeah. I had been on breakfast television. I, yeah. Uh, what else? There's so we played a conferences yeah not a clue so i say but this you sounded good i sounded good because i could speak the language and i used my ears i could listen right. and i could follow I, I could follow usually without even knowing the chord progression well enough to to not make a fool of myself right so the reason i say this is, is not to brag because no. i'm not saying it's the best route to learning music i'm saying it's a route to learning right. music and that every route has its merit and every route is good as long as you're progressing in the direction you want to progress. If you want to learn music, 
it's good for you, it's good for others, and you should progress in that direction. Right. Um, at this point, I realized I needed formal assistance. <laughs> I, need, <laughs> so, I need help. I need help. So I get through, start plowing through these books. I join uh, a funk university online with uh, Bootsy Collins. Yeah, I mean, I'm so you're watching doing online based college at this time. Yeah, I'm I'm doing. Uh, you I know, remember. I remember. And the, the charts uh, are the coming in time. from Soup Can Dan, and and yeah. I'm trying to read those charts and learning tab and standard notation and reading time signatures and odd time signatures and and just throwing myself into the grammar of it now reading books right. i got the jackal pest stories method book i started working through that and just trying to figure out how it all worked how, how what's how do the key signatures work how do the scales work what are modes like and and just start delving yeah. down and it's when i i started to sink my teeth into victor wooten's uh the bass lesson uh yeah the lesson book the, yeah, and the then lesson. the movie uh the groove workshop yeah and and met um, Anthony so Wellington through then that. we got Anthony Wellington to come do us a, uh, a come class. Here, he, yeah, came we, to we Connor's get, music. Yeah, right here to the shop to do a group class, and that was uh, like incredible. I don't know, was that through a funk you mix? With no, a bunch of emails. No, that was me. You know that throwing caution to the wind and right. like fear fearlessness that I, right. I threw. So Anthony was doing a clinic in Toronto, and. I love the video. I love the teaching style. I love the YouTube videos. Everything I was learning from Anthony and from Victor online was just gold. And it was simple. It made sense. It was the building blocks of music in an in a understandable, digestible way versus the formal stuff that was just, it's almost as if they chose to use language that was confusing to make it elitist, it seemed to me. Like it was like intentionally confusing. Yeah. And and it's like algebra and math was intentionally confusing to me. It was like, why does that X, why do I solve for X if you can't explain to me why I'm solving for X? Yeah. I need to know the foundation under this. And if, if you don't present it into a way that makes logical sense, right then I'm not going to memorize it. I'm not going to care. I'm going to say it's useless to me. So it had been presented this whole time in a very language that was so intimidating and right. confusing. And and even within those realms, there was a dichotomy. Like the, the guitar method world was spoke a different language than the classically trained world, and they didn't see eye to eye on certain topics. And then I start... Victor and Anthony connect these dots for me in a in a understanding both guitar and classical piano training world. So then I realized to myself that the bass player is that connection between the drummer, mm -hmm. the guitar player, and the rest of the band. This, and that is to speak the language of all of them and help them see each other and meet musically, but also like linguistically when discussing this theory. So I just start delving into this. Um, so um, uh, Anthony is doing this clinic in Toronto and <laughs> I go, you know what? I'm just gonna shoot him a Facebook message. Maybe he'll come to Keswick. He's gonna be in Toronto anyway. So I just shoot him a message. Hey Anthony, I see you're doing a clinic in Toronto. Do you think you do a clinic in Keswick while well, you're in the area? And he sent me his cell number and he said, call me. And I was like, that's not real. So I call it and he answers and he's like, hey, Dave. I'm like, what? <laughs> like I was in shock that. You're actually talking. I'm not actually with his, like, talking with or... an, someone I idolize, somebody that I'm inspired an by. An incredible somebody, musician. An inc incredible musician, a teacher um, that just explains it in such a, a, a comfortable, respectful, loving manner that it's like, ah. Oh, this makes musical sense to me. This helps me understand the language I'm speaking. So he says, yeah, here's here's my contact information for my agent. Uh, connect the dots, I'm in. So we do all that, everything's in play. We're sorting out all the details. And then a few days before he's like, uh, I just realized, Dave, I don't know how I'm gonna get to Keswick. I was like, oh, you want me to pick you up at the airport? He's like, you do that? Yeah, count me in, yeah, no problem. 
So Connor Bowden and I drive down the airport, a little sign, <laughs> Anthony Wellington. <laughs> hey! Like right from the movies. These, these right. bearded bass player and drummer, hippie looking fellows standing in an airport. Of course, right. we were the guys picking up a musician, right? right? right. And then <laughs> we had an amazing day together and all my student bass students uh, were we, there. And We had a, a good turnout of... Oh. Uh, uh, students, uh, young and old alike. Uh, yeah, bass players, local are not bass, bass players. players. Yeah, right? like just musicians, right? Yeah. And I like to make that point that like you don't, as much as I always say I'm just a bass player. Um, we speak the language of music, and we need to make it universal. Mm-hmm. And and if you're a bass player, or a trumpet player, or a piano player, you're a musician, and we're all musicians. We come together. So, um, I want to make that clear, even though no, I always joke every true. day. I'm like, I'm just a bass player. I don't want to do that. I have this interesting so. thing where um, from all, all the different instruments that I play, and you'd, you'd brought this point earlier, and I'm just going to bring it back yeah. around, where each one has its own subtle accent, if you will. If, mm. if music is a language, yeah. the way you speak bass and the way you speak guitar and the way you speak classical piano or, or rock piano even, even mm-hmm. the subgenres, electric guitar, or shred tastic metal guitar versus classical guitar. Yeah, you know, there's 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 language around all of that that is different. There is an underlying, you know, uh, universality to it that we were able to connect on. Mm-hmm. But uh, peeling back layer one to get down to that universal area is something that yeah. I think people forget to do. Yeah, and and a lot of the times, certain instruments when they the more they progress, they do create this like elitist. Uh, right. language where they're like, oh, you, you do, you know, who did you study with? Was oh, what, should, what right. mode were it was, you using? Oh, yeah. Was, oh, yeah. And, and there's yeah. almost like a, a, um, not like a challenge, but there's like a, oh, you know, how are you playing that? Which style are you playing it in? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Right. And it's, well, and you just want to just sit down and make music and yeah. share it. Well, and I, I think anyone I've met that, that tends to portray that, I think it's, a, um, the, their insecurities are manifesting. They're, they're creating it because they work so hard to get there and they're afraid that you know something they don't know. Mm. Oh, that brings me back to the Anthony Wellington point. Right. Sorry. <laughs> You're supposed to remind me, right? <laughs> okay. So four levels of awareness, he four said Four levels in music. of awareness. And actually, we should talk about Anthony and we should talk about Victor's... Okay. So four levels of awareness. He said, you buy that bass guitar... And that first day, and you say, it's unknowing, unknowing. You don't know what you don't know. You're just excited. you got a bass. I'm going to be a bass player. I'm going to be Anthony Wellington. I'm going to be Flea. I'm going to be John Emmons. So I'm going to, whoever whoever you idolize, you know, uh, Getty Lee. Uh, I mean, the, the list is huge of amazing bass players. Marcus Miller, Stanley Clark. Anyways, I'm going to be that because you have no idea how hard it is to do what they do. You just got a bass, man, and you hit it, and it makes a bass sound. So you're, you're unknowing, unknowing. Right. So then the next level of awareness, and hopefully I get this all straight, I should have made notes, but is knowing unknowing. Yeah. So now you know what you don't know. Right. And that's the scariest place to be. Right. Because that's that first day you try and do that riff and you can't. You're right. like, man, now I know how hard this is. This is, I, I don't know. I know how hard this is. That's what it is. Yeah. yeah. You know how little you know. Yeah. And I think there's a like a, a, a Socratic moment there uh, where it's like the uh, a mark of I'm, I'm paraphrasing it, but the mark of intelligence is knowing that you're the least intelligent person in the room or something to that effect. <laughs> where you know I know how yeah. little I know, yeah. and that's what makes me the smartest person in this. It was like it's kind of you know again you yeah. But anyways, continue. So uh, then you you progress, and now you, it's knowing knowing, and this is uh, you now know that thing that you were trying to do. Mm-hmm. But you have to think about it. You really oh. have to think about it to execute yeah, it. Yeah. And it's hard to play in time. It's hard to to be confident and play that with others that are professionals when you're knowing, knowing. But it, but at least you know, like, I can do this, right? right. Um, and then the last uh, level is um, unknowing, knowing. Or I might get those flipped. But the point is, you're, you know it so well, you no longer have to think about it. At that point, it's, it, that's a great feeling. So now, like when we play a gig, <laughs> I can have my beverage. I can play the bass line with one hand. I can be singing. I can, right. I can check, lean check off the, the score of the hockey check game. Check the score of the hockey game. Don't I can, check the score. Of the I do check I the score, especially the Leafs. I can, because I played hockey so long. Right. I can lean off stage and have, you know, the Somebody, manager yeah. talking in my ear while I'm wearing an in ear monitor here while I'm singing and while I'm playing bass and autopilot through the music that we've rehearsed. Mm-hmm. But the point 
to to draw from that is that's the thing that I'm knowing unknowing. Yeah, I know I know it so well. I don't have to think about it. Knowing unknowing, uh, but there's things that I still you're in all four states at some point with your musical journey, right. and to to keep that in mind because there's things I don't know. I don't know. Right. There's things I know I don't know. There's things that I have to think about while I play, and those aren't the things I play at the gig, you right. know. And then there's the things I play at the gig. So what that tells me is in every part of your musical journey with these four levels of awareness, um, this ties right to Victor Wooten's beautiful point, the way he discusses learning a language, is the beginners need to speak it with professionals. Yes. Right. And he's, he said, that's how we learn English. Our children speak with the adults. And the right. adults mimic and join in and encourage and speak positively about teaching that child how to speak the language long before there's grammar, long before you work on mechanics of it all. Right. It's just speaking it. And if you mispronounce a word like spaghetti yeah. and you Puschetti. say Puschetti, they might encourage you to continue saying that way just for, you know, for a while. Right. And then gets you, if, if that gets, gets you, you comfortable and happy yeah. and you're speaking it. And um, so... Even as a professional, I know that I can walk into a room and be that child with a musician right. of all levels. There's a child that will know more than me about something, you know, and I, I should I should walk in with open ears and, and open mind and say, you know. And, and an open heart. And an open heart. No, <laughs> and know true. that I'm going to walk into a space where I'm, I need to be open to learning, not close to learning. And, and that's where that elitist, that like, oh, what are you, that kind of attitude Right. needs needs to leave because there's something to be learned from everyone but yeah. there's also things I can teach everyone right and everything in between there's, there's always there's an opportunity in every moment yes there's an opportunity That's getting for something quite philosophical no but it's yeah. true like, <laughs> you're I mean, right as, as a musician yeah. but i mean like when as a music instructor i same thing i have students yeah. who share music i never would have listened to absolutely and they they bring music across my desk say i'd like to learn this i'm like well, what on earth is this well i saw it on and they like saw it on Instagram or TikTok or whatever, and I'm like, yeah. oh, okay, cool. Oh, yeah. Take a look, and I'm like, that's actually really cool music, right? Yeah. I, and now I like it, and I've added that into my realm of music that I like yeah. to listen to, right? So yeah. I I am so thankful for what my students give me in, mm -hmm. in our music in our music exchange. Yes, right. Uh, well, that's great. Every student I teach, I do learn something from. Yeah, and uh, and I make it clear to them that I do that. I think that that needs to be expressed. Um, that they're teaching me something along the way, and then I'm sharing what I know the way I know it. A right. And I always also make a point saying. This is not the rule of law. This is not the only way. This is the way that works for me. These are the mechanics. Isn't the Mandalorian? This is the way. <laughs> I haven't watched the Mandalorian. Oh, okay. yet. Sorry, oh. no spoilers. Anyways, not that that was a, right. that was a quote. But so that idea that you know having a humble heart going into it that way, that you're willing to be open to, yeah, to, as, even as a professional musician, yeah, right. And that's like we're one thing that I've uh, a number of my students and there was a quote I had in a lesson with a student and it stuck and we we joke about it often is that I said like you know I'm I'm your music instructor I'm your music teacher but. I think of myself in art as an adult student. So I said, you already know how to play. You already know a whack about music. My goal isn't to for you to just, you know, take my brain, download it, and become me. I don't want that at all. Um, I want to be your musical Sherpa. Yeah. And as I said, I said I'm, my goal is to get you up be the mountain. Be my music Sherpa. Right? <laughs> and you might, yeah, there's something there. But I said, my goal is to get you up the mountain. It's yeah. your journey up the mountain. My yep. goal is just to assist you along the way. And and help direct and say, you don't want to do that route, and that's probably not the right climbing gear. And that <laughs> right? might cause carpal tunnel. <laughs> right, right, you know, right. Like the little things like that yeah. we can we can point out, those mechanics. It me mechanics, is, that's yeah. a huge thing. So bringing it back around, the different vehicles, the different avenues that people learn right. music. Yeah. So there are a lot of people out there that are self-taught. Yes. There are a lot of people that are, um, that are using tools like YouTube to to ingest information yeah a lot of information and some not right information but and, some and, amazing information and some information that might be right but not right for them and or not, not right now not right now right yeah. so that's that's important um there's there's people who learn through uh you know uh, a course or through school uh there's people that learn through uh individual one-on-one -on -one lessons or group lessons there's people that learn from being in a band yeah and that's you know where the the aspect of team or community 
you know what I mean, is so important for yeah. for some. So they learn, they're inspired more through learning in that experience rather than in a one-on-one experience, right? So I think one of the things um, leading into this that we were chatting about is that there are a lot of different avenues on that journey. And even still, there might be a time where that one avenue, like learning on your own, helps for a step here, but you yeah. might need to go go to each channel differently for a different part of your musical journey to grow. Well, you know, this. I'll probably butcher this once again. Very I'm not it. always the uh, most intellectual individual, and maybe I need you, more notes, but... You're, you're very... No, no, no. When it comes oh, to our... Right, 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 right. You're a very smart guy. Right, 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 right. That's all, folks. Sometimes... <laughs> I, what it is is I know sometimes it, trying to get it from here to here. Okay, fair enough. Like, no, no, yeah, I'm better I, to getting getting it to here short. musically than I am getting it out my mouth. Um, but I was what? That's okay. Continue. It's good. <laughs> it gets so it's funky. good. It's good. Uh, that's why I don't like singing. I don't even know the lyrics to most of our songs. I just it's really anyways. Um, okay, so let's see if I can draw this parallel successfully. Jordan Peterson again. He was he was referencing Jung, who was a psycholo- clinical, uh, clinical psychologist. So, yeah, and he was talking about marriage and for a marriage to work, okay, to be successful, it had to be um, put into a bottle, like a chemist bottle, and kept in there under pressure. Meaning, like divorce is not an option. Like you're 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 saying. Keep this bottle. We are married and there's no way out. We have to figure this out. We have to work it out. Okay. Let's see if this parallel works. So by heat and pressure, building is the only way for someone to transform and meld two things together to a homogeneous substance. So you're talking about a chemistry. This is a chemistry chemistry reference. reference, yeah. Yeah. So in learning music, if you don't put your musical contents periodically at least under pressure and heat right you're not going to truly evolve into the next level agreed so uh, yeah that, I, I i agree with what you're saying there if about you the idea that, uh and again we we said this earlier is challenge yourself but yeah challenge yourself can be a very broad brush yeah. and and to improve as a musician you put your contents under pressure and heat and then you turn into a new substance musically so what's what's an example of heat and pressure performance performance is a big one um interacting with others musically Mm -hmm. uh in even a jam setting can be heat and pressure for some depending where you are in the journey a jam is a form of performance and as soon as you take your craft and you share it with anybody yeah even your mom even your mom some for some people that's the most heat and pressure right well yeah but i mean for a lot of us you know we start off our first performances are for our family members yeah. and and even I have I have students all the time adult students kids doesn't matter where they'll say I did it so much better at home yeah I I could I I, hear that. I have that all the time all with the my time. students right and time. that brings me to an interesting point about private lessons specifically when you get into that one-on-one setting mm-hmm. we we try as instructors to make it a very comfortable environment but most of us do <laughs> Some of us, the, we, those of us that are, I speak to yeah. you and I. Yeah, you and I are. There very, are instructors yeah. that don't. <laughs> you know, I I've been known to get out the ruler stick. <laughs> Rap. No, <laughs> but um, Th- those days are gone. So, I had a customer <laughs> in the other day who said, "I want to learn music, but I'm not good enough to do private lessons." And I right. was like, "Okay, hold up here. What do you mean? You don't have to be good to start to learn, right?" Right. And it was, well, it was the realization that he wasn't ready for that type of heat and that much pressure. Mm-hmm. He wanted to do it in a comfortable setting and progress to a certain point where he felt like he could then apply that heat and pressure. He was he was willing to take lessons. He was in, in, intrigued with the idea of lessons. He took a brochure, but he said, not right now. I'll just buy the book and I'm going to try and work on it myself to try and get good enough to take lessons. Yeah. And... Um, so that was a realization in that moment where I was realizing that, that the fear of an instructor criticizing or judging for many people is difficult. And, and you know, youth, like kids, they'll fall down, they'll get up, and they'll keep running. But an adult falls down, they usually look around to see who saw them fall down. Right. Now, 
That's a quote, just to be clear. That was Victor Anthony once again. I gleaned so Good much from them. Quote. I love them, and I want to reference right. it as much as possible so that it doesn't There's come across. no way Dave came up with that. I did not so, come up with that. I'm like, like everything has been a quote, a and I got to... <laughs> okay, I'm going to have to... What's it called? In, your you know those knowledge. essays I was supposed to write yeah. that I didn't do good at, but I did well enough at that I passed? Uh, what's it? Footnotes? Yeah, sure. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah, think yeah, we'll have to have footnotes at the end of of everyone we reference, I reference. Anyways, so... But it's so true. As an adult... You know, learning to, if you got an injury and you got to relearn how to walk, it can be a very intimidating thing where a kid learning to walk doesn't care. They just try it and they fall down, they try it and they fall down, right. they crawl, they'll, they'll military crawl across the floor if they want that toy. They don't care. Right. You know, but for adults, that's, that's a challenge. And so I find with adult students, there is a, a, a lot more resistance to adding heat and pressure to their musical journey. Right. And as a result, it, it extends the musical journey. It makes it harder to learn quickly. Like they right. say, they say kids learn so quickly. They're like sponges. But and ultimately it's, it's risk. It's, it's willingness risk. to risk. Risk analysis. And, right. and yeah, right. yeah, absolutely. So, or, or the lack of analysis. Like yeah. That they're not now, concerning themselves with. There are, once again, we get back to those, uh, the, uh, I think it's a minority, a small minority of musicians that come across as that elitist attitude towards beginners. Yeah, I would like, think. Well, and I think that the, you know, it doesn't come from a place of malice. I think what it happens is. I, is like I said, it was well, a, a place of, no, but it was fear. a place of their own insecurities, yeah, right? Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. but, um, but I think that's where that fear comes from or that fear is bred from, that that's a greater percentage of musicians that have that attitude. But almost every professional, like, profession, more professional than me, <laughs> more famous sure. than me musician I've yeah. met has been so down to earth, right. so wonderful to deal with, True. so talented, so kind, you know, in sharing what they do. Yeah. Very few I've ever met had had like a bad attitude or an elitist attitude or, right. you know, that was a very humble person when right. you had them off the stage and then they they do their thing on stage. But on backstage, like if we're doing sound for them or we're helping them or we're at a festival playing and they're on the stage before or after or yeah. when we're doing those workshops at Mariposa with them, every one of them was just so wonderful to deal yeah. with and, and it was great. So Yeah, you, you love that. Uh, and again, the musician community. Mm -hmm. And and that's the thing is you want to, uh, the actual in-person musician community as opposed to like the online, like right, right keyboard warrior, well, right. and Make there's, an there's and, no and, checkpoint for those people online to have um, a negative attitude towards others and present that as a, a reality. So, so I mean, that is a fear of, once again, that online self-taught search. You can find a lot of wrong information, but you can also find a lot of bad attitude, like a lot of yeah. negative opinion and judgment. Right. And, well, and, and that and, breeds and that fear, that private that lessons... Definitive Right? Yeah, where it's well, like, that's the other thing. They they know only, that the, only a Sith deals in absolutes. <laughs> they know what they know, so they present it as the only path. Right, and like when I say, "Oh, I'm gonna play finger per fret one, two, three, four, well, I can bring up a ton of bass players who've made way more money than me playing with one finger. Like, right. like I'm not gonna say this is the only way to play the bass. I say this is the most efficient way I found to play the bass and to achieve playing those riffs. But, but we got to make it work for you. Let's make it work for you. Some people, I had a student who had a finger injury and it's like, okay, right. well, you're not going to use that finger well. Wait, what, so what let's not, say? how do we work around that? Right. You know? So, and then once again, I can pull up videos for 60s, 70s, all the way through to now and, and pull up great bass players who who use one finger, two fingers, whatever. Right. And had have made amazing bass riffs and amazing records and have recorded and toured the world and made millions of dollars. And, and, and I go, am I going to tell him he plays the bass wrong? Right. Or like, uh, what was it? Um, like the embouchure of like Dizzy Gillespie or Louis Armstrong. Oh yeah, so right? many people were like, oh, the, the embouchure was horrible and that's why his cheeks did that. Both of them. Yeah, both of right? them, yeah. But, and, uh, but are you gonna judge the quality of the music based on that? Right. And again, we, we talk about best practice, but not only They're also only practice. some of the best, best musicians. trumpet players yeah. ever, mm. Cornet. So good. Yeah. Yeah, cool. good man, Cornet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you go, uh, whoa. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, oh, that reminds me. I just saw a video clip the other day of Dizzy in a classroom setting teaching. Oh, no. Way. And he was talking about counting time. Okay. And uh, once again, I'll probably butcher this, but I just loved it so much. That's all right. So he goes, um, you know, how do I keep in time? And, you know, with groove and how, how do I keep it all together? 
He goes, I don't count one, two, three, four. I don't worry about my foot. He says, your head's connected to your foot, and if your foot makes a mistake, it's going to throw your head off. Okay. He goes, I just listened to this. In my head. And he goes, then I'm always in time. And I was like, whoa. Like, he doesn't count at all. He just he just feels the groove, feels the pulse. And he goes, I may play the wrong notes, but I'm never out of time. <laughs> I was like, "Oh man, that's brilliant!" And and you talk about um, timing for musicians. That's a whole other category. And and you know, there's people who know the language, but they don't necessarily know how to to express it in the right time. Yeah. Right. And uh, and that. So for my own, you know, musical journey, um, I started off on drums. Yep. Started off trading drum lessons for, to dad for lessons on how to play Tetris and Minesweeper on his work computer <laughs> when I was about seven. Yeah. I was like, well, that's how you play Tetris, Dad. That way when you're, you know, stuck on a boring phone call. And I don't know, his old boss knew that. But anyways. Yeah, this is the old so, Tandy yeah, computer. Yeah, old, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, win, uh, Windows 3.1. Oh, yeah. Anyways. Well, that was post-DOS. Like that yeah, first computer was I'm DOS. I'm talking post-DOS. Where you had to like dot .exe. Yeah, yeah, like you had C-DOS, to literally be a programmer. C-DOS run. Run DOS, just run. To- yeah, yeah. Just to open the yeah, game. Yeah. I felt like such a programmer with DOS. Anyways, oh, I know. So um, so then trading off for drum lessons, but my drum instructor, who was Adam Malloy um, at that time, you're, you're bringing it full circle there. And yeah. uh, uh, working through the Joel Rothman series for uh, for reading drums, I read timing first. I, I actually had no... So I was very comfortable with reading time signatures, note values, phrasing, expressing all of that. Um it took a long time till I, I st- and so I began teaching drums at a younger age, just for the little wee ones, including a young, you'd mentioned him earlier, a young Connor Bowden oh, at yes. the age of yeah. uh, five, six. I love I that photo. His, his uh, show and tell project at school. <laughs> Did you a, go to his school? No, he brought oh. a photo of me. I want to show and tell my drum teacher. That's and that, awesome. that felt great, right? And so, um, but I, I was doing that part of the language. And then later on, with the other instruments that I, I slowly picked up, it was like, well, now I have to learn the language of bass guitar. And now I have to learn the language. And I, I did sight reading for, especially because I was doing it in high school, uh, yeah. bass guitar. And then um, because the music teacher told me that I wasn't allowed to do drums because drums weren't an instrument. That right. was that was a quote that stuck. And that was like, sa- <laughs> same music teacher after oh. I graduated said, I... <laughs> I'm never going to let anyone else play bass guitar in the band. <laughs> so, so yeah. But that's another story Hold altogether. On. Anyways, but that's, and you talk about like that, that ex- here I am 14 and it was like, well, that's not really, it's not really an instrument. Yeah. And I don't think that's what she meant. I think no. it might've meant that I can teach or that works in the setting or whatever. But yeah. like there was a drum kit in the room. But you know, if I was me now, I would have in in your shoes then. Yeah. You know, I would have said, what do you mean? The rhythm's everything. There's only 12 notes. Right. <laughs> There's only well, and 12 that's different more notes. More knowledge than, right? So, like, oh, good, you know those 12 notes. Yeah. And and so anyway, <laughs> just coming back from timing, I'm going to bring it back there, was uh, having that, that was the foundation of my, I started with timing. Yeah. And learning how to express and read and chart and, and, and all that with timing first. And I think that's an interesting perspective. I don't know, you know, some people think that you know for young beginners uh they should start with piano for all sorts of good reasons it's a very linear layout as to how notes interact you really get to see exactly how the interactions are built as opposed to on an instrument um with strings and frets whether bass banjo guitar mandolin ukulele where everything you end up being um caught in a language of positions yeah which i always say don't let yourself get caught in the box right you know because know the box i find know the bo- a lot of, you know need the it box. but then you gotta step outside gotta of step it outside yeah of but once again that's that okay now we've got this right. framework the major scale in a box or the pentatonic scale or whatever yeah, yeah and now we're gonna put it under pressure and and heat yeah and, and, and we're gonna tell you okay take these two notes but you're gonna play them over here right right and now you're playing through two positions okay great now let's play that through two positions through two octaves right okay great you know and you just start pushing a little bit a little bit and before you know it that proficiency of the fingerboard becomes something but that proficiency of piano is linear you're right so there's so for yeah i'll bring it i often go back to the piano when i'm teaching bass just just say just just look there's the major scale c major scale c like on the bass it doesn't doesn't visually make sense yeah Yeah. and and so learning music in a linear versus positional uh Mm -hmm. you know 
uh, conversation. So as a result, myself n- having taken piano lessons, but not really, I wouldn't call it an instrument that like I took brief some piano, a couple months of piano lessons just mm. in my like journey of wanting to just be a sponge. Right. Yeah. So, so a different approach in our journeys of music. Yeah. Too, right. Um, where you wanted to be a sponge. And I was like, I, I wanted to quietly be a sponge. I wanted yeah. to be a sponge when nobody was looking. So right. the shop would close at nine o'clock. I wanted to night. be on stage, not yeah, being I, a sponge. Well, it was, you know, and it, it, people talk about like family placement being the number three brother. Mm. So you guys were on stage playing with the band. Yeah. I was too young. You're right. And so I yeah. would go downstairs when the store was closed and everybody was gone. And I'd pick up an instrument and I would quietly try to figure it out and then put it back in. Okay, time for bed. Right. And then yeah, obviously it doesn't work with the drum kit. It was the dr- I couldn't do that with my drums. Right. right. So my drums were set up. Um and uh, and so that was a vo- very obvious one, but like picking up a mandolin or a banjo or a ukulele or a guitar mm-hmm. or or your bass when you weren't looking. You yeah, know. I felt that. Though. I, I know. my strings. You're like, like ooh, my strings feel different. They got they got peanut butter and jam. Uh, somebody touched <laughs> my bass. Some, there's some yeah. peanut butter honey. All I, over I had it. a second bass for you. Then I, I was like, you can I remember, use that yeah, bass, yeah. but don't touch this one. So you know, uh, brothers, brotherly love. Yeah, but so that idea that you know uh, being able to to explore music in in a very um, very like I said, it's a safe space, but I mean it was a safe environment because it was just me quietly on my yeah. own. But then it later, was... you talk about your bottling pressure, which yeah. was one of the first times was after your MTC band had broken up. Yeah. Um, during MTC, I was officially cowboy, or uh, cowboy, cowbell <laughs> slash bongo boy. Hippie guy, eh? bongo no. boy. Yeah. This is like so. I got to play in the <laughs> on certain gigs that, yeah. where there was like a little auxiliary percussion. Yeah. I don't um, know. And then the other setting was when we played, we had a, a band with dad um, called Eighth Day. Oh, yeah. And so there was a, a, a run with that where we were on stage with two drummers. I would have been 14, 13, 14 years yeah. old. But, I, but you talk about pressure, but uh, pressure, uh, controlled pressure in this case was that dad was also playing drums. Yeah. So we had two kits on stage. Any of the songs where the drums were really, really comfortable, very, you know, you know, 4-4 rock beat, nice and driven, you right? He'd leave me to do that, and he would go pick up a guitar. Right. And anything with slightly more complex drums, I might do my basic rhythm along with it, or play across the toms a little bit more. Mm-hmm. And and he would lay down. He would be in charge of the groove. He'd be driving it, and then I had the opportunity to have those experiences that way. Yeah. So the, you talk about your pressure, but that was a controlled pressure. Yeah. And um, calculated. Yeah. Right. So I give huge credit uh, to that experience. And yeah. back to my uh, falling on your face being so important. That, w- that was the gig we got booed off stage at the Crown Plaza. We didn't get booed. It was borderline booed. There was no booing. It, what it was was we went on break. No, and, and we got and a the, suggestion. And, and the guys were like, hey, can we just listen to our own music? We brought a CD well, player I and mean, a CD. Let's just talk about wrong band at the wrong place. Doing it place, right on right? the wrong side of town. Yeah. Continue. I mean, it reminds me of if we had a pulled. Oh, I think we did do one like uh, reggae tune. Um, right. do but more yeah. of that month, yeah, yeah. but, uh, it reminds me of the blues brothers in oh, that, yeah. that Bob's setting Country when Bunker. they, yeah, yeah. Right. It was a hundred percent that boom, boom, boom. we were playing the tragically hip and, and classic so, rock tunes yeah, classic and they rock want the 90s rock reggae, bands. Latin, like, yeah. I was like, so they had, they had CDs of, of the person of who tunes. did the booking liked us uh, and, the and they didn't the think about event. anyone who was attending the event. <laughs> they, they just thought about themselves and booked the band. So, but it was a really, he was really polite. The guy just said, yeah. Can you put the CD can you, on? Can just, and you guys continue on break? And we stayed on break. And then I think we went into the bar lounge, sat by the grand piano, and, yeah. you know, had to. And, and we were given, because uh, there was a You snowstorm. were 14, so you didn't was, have a beer. I did not. <laughs> you would have been 16. You also didn't have a, you did not have a beer. Do not. Are you sure I didn't? Uh, have... Yeah, you didn't okay. have a beer. Um, but we were, uh, and then I learned that, you know, uh, there was a, at 14, I learned you could put the best possible music out there in the world. And it just might not be. It's it's not your fault if it's not well received. Right. It's it, it like that. It, it it doesn't. And it also it doesn't mean it doesn't. And they matter. let us play our whole first set. It and was, they yeah. they they said, applauded. Like it yeah, they, it were, they were engaged. But it was, yeah, it wasn't booed yeah. off stage. But it was no. kindly said. Like we'd rather listen to our CD player. Yeah. They wanted to dance. They wanted to party. Right. It and was that's good. We're doing it right on the wrong side of town. Yeah. But those two and within you know timeline, you're talking about like grade nine and grade yeah you know, grade eight grade nine for as a musician doing these gigs right um, yeah. but that's where i was able to pull those experiences from, from of uh, uh you know those two s- stick out huge as as these like yeah. 
make or break moments where it ha- being told could could you guys sit aside we'd rather listen to a cd player yeah right versus you know like that that could be there's a lot of people that that would be break like, like yeah, just, earth shattering yeah, just walk away, i quit right? and you know and so yeah um but you know i knew we were doing it right on the wrong side of town right it's just like you can put the best music out there and and you know you have to find the right people to share it with for sure so so i mean let's just kind of maybe bring this all back around to yeah. how to learn music mm-hmm. we've talked about yeah. lots of different avenues, avenues. we talked about that you might start on one path and yeah. then that it's good to try other paths right yeah. like you might start with learning on your own or you might start with private lessons and then take what you've learned and then practice on your own you might start yeah. in one of you might start like yourself really start playing in a band and or in a group environment and that will drive you back to learning the fundamentals yeah right so there's lots of different avenues every avenue is, is and, is, and i th- yeah is all positive i think uh, i think the biggest thing is um if you love music do, do more, more than, than just listen, listen. <laughs> and how do we promote the the idea of the love of music right, right? like um there's nothing that makes me more sad to hear than somebody who said i did this formal lessons i hated it i got forced to practice i went all the way to royal conservatory grade eight piano and i haven't touched it since right and it's like why haven't you touched it what right. happened i had another friend who's like went to humber jazz bass quit right not touching it anymore it was like why not right what like maybe that's not the avenue for you but but don't throw away your voice right like just just step back and find a different avenue for your voice it doesn't have to fit in to the expectations of others right but a willingness to love music to listen to music to want to share in music to want to make your own music express that with others if you're mm-hmm. up for it if not don't but then that willingness to to eventually put it under pressure yeah. and see if you find can those opportunities if you to... can find those opportunities to put it under pressure and see if you can make it a little take another step another step forward make it just a little a little more because the better you know your language the better you can convey your feelings right and what you're trying to say that that story you're trying to tell and all of music was born from storytelling, I, I believe. I think the origin right. of music You're like was the idea of, yeah, it was the idea of passing down a story from generation to yeah. generation. And nothing helps you memorize something better than music. Right. Like you, you're not going to memorize an essay but you could memorize 500 songs worth of lyrics probably. Most people, if they want to, if they love the music, they'll remember every lyric from the whole band's discography and every melody, and they can sing along to everything. And you say, what was that sentence so-and-so said yesterday? Oh, I, don't I can't remember it. You know. Right. And I think that, that music helps you memorize things. It helps you share those things. And so there's a, a reason to learn music. But then how to learn music is is to, to just a willingness to step forward and try it on your own, a willingness to reach out to others to, to, to see what they can share with you, and then a willingness to put that under pressure and challenge yourself to, to better. I, uh, you led me to a one point I'm going to quickly hit yeah. because I, brought, I got the book. I brought the book. This, yeah. is, uh, this is your brain on music. Yeah. Um, and uh, really neat, really neat book that was talking about um, – which is not the topic today, which is like how to learn music. Yeah. This And so I, I misunderstood the assignment. Uh, <laughs> but I did my homework, which was why to learn music. So there's just a little passage I wanted to uh, hit out of this quickly because um, it just talks about what you, you This hit was the, the question really well. you grilled me with earlier. Well, it was kind of. Yeah, exactly. It was, so uh, Glenn Schellenberg has pointed out the importance of distinguishing short-term from long-term effects of music. The Mozart effect uh, referred to immediate benefits, basically, like they I, I'm, in the book they talk about. I'm paraphrasing the idea that, like, if you listen to classical music while you do something, there's like, you know, while you're studying, the plants grow better. The, the plants yeah. grow better. Yeah. There's, you could please. There's studies out please there. Please research all yeah. this stuff. Um, <laughs> but other research has revealed long term effects of musical activity. Music listening enhances or changes certain neural circuits, including the density of dendritic connections in the primary. Uh, auditory cortex. Wow, that's like super science, right? Yeah. Rock on. The Harvard neuroscientist Gottfried Schlaug 
has shown that the front portion of the corpus callosum, the mass of fibers connecting the two cerebral hemispheres, is significantly larger in musicians than non-musicians, and particular for, particularly for musicians who began their training early. This reinforces the notion that music operations become bilateral with increased training as musicians coordinate and recruit neural structures in both the left and right hemispheres. This is a very, very brief excerpt of this book. I feel smarter already. <laughs> but, but the idea is that um, using, especially for young beginners, yeah. and that was a, kind of a point there, we hear people all the time, like, I need to put my kids into music because we want them uh, to have the benefits, the actual yeah. biologically tested like, benefits of like vitamins and vitamins veg yeah, eat exactly. your vegetables or whatever right. and, dietary and, plan you're on exactly yeah. so <laughs> uh one of the things i think that would be part of the pedagogy here at connor's music like the, the culture the music culture we try to breed is that studying music at an early age doesn't necessarily mean like right that you have to some people they want that structure of like a yep. like an rcm approach and, and we, we can have we that. have it we and it's can. wonderful for people who want it yes. absolutely but the fact that um a, a, a musical immersion a music exposure uh the, the individual has to have the willingness to expose themselves to that fear and right. when it's forced you don't get the benefits no no good so tr supporting the love mm -hmm. building the love of music mm -hmm. is the best stepping stone forward to all the cognitive benefits of music, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It, building a hatred for music, well, it doesn't matter how much you listen to Mozart if you hate it. Right, right. Yeah. And they, actually, I think in the plant study, at least this would be, I think I'm, I think I'm quoting uh, Mythbusters, yeah. uh, where they did it with uh, different genres of music. Yeah. And I, 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 so it wasn't, I don't was think it, it was just. It was just vibrations Mozart. in general. I think they had death You could just put too. sine wave. No, because <laughs> they actually had it where if they talked angry to the plants, they actually did poor. Oh, okay. So like it actually. Specific me, frequencies. Don't even get me started. Tone. Trees talk, man. Oh, they do. I know. I watched the Magic School Bus on that one. Magic School Bus. <laughs> right. So it's very good. Anyway, so. I meant to bring a book as well, right. which I... Yeah, The Music Lesson well, by Victor And Luton. it's... I it's, can't find it. You know it's somewhere was? in my you house. You it to me. I read it. Yeah. And then we par started passing it around to all the staff here. Yeah, I wonder so if Jesse... I, I got to call one of our One of our staff, former <laughs> staff have it. But it's a beautiful idea of bringing it, music up into elements. And linguistically, it's very different than this book. Yes. So they're to, very... Wherever you're at in your musical journey, you can read one of those books. Yeah, yeah. If this is a little... Over my I head. Think I, I don't think I recommend this book for, for casual reading. Okay. I, that's not I wasn't going to casually no, read it myself. No, I don't think myself. so. I, I haven't read it. It's a bestseller, either. though. <laughs> I've quoted it. I've, I, I, I want the Coles notes of this yeah. book. My, <laughs> I'm dad sure it can be it, arranged. He's, yeah, I know. But, um, but a lot what's, of what's going dad's on. Dad's IQ, though, is like I know, I know. off the charts, fella. man. That's we like... that's like We talk about Big Daddy P and... That's like a bathroom reader for him. So, but that idea that we know the benefits... Especially Absolutely. He read the book and then told us. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for telling me about Thank the benefits. I am listening. <laughs> so, but yeah, no. Open the ears. Lesson, Open on the ears. other hand, is especially for a lot of my students, when they get to that point where they, you know, they're they, curious. The, the uh, unknown, no, and the no, no in your stage. Yeah, my of unknowing, unknowing, knowing, yeah, yeah. no. So knowing. when they get to like stage two or three in their conversation, yeah. Not to the point where they can play and. and well, when you're at knowing, knowing, and you're worried about moving forward that book helps unlock yes, that yes agreed so yeah, it's that, like that willingness three, to let go right? of the fear is when is when i think once the again music lesson by victor wooten is a, a wonderful reading. willingness to put yourself yeah there's a to the, face that fear um there's there's and there's definitely tools in that that i impart in my lessons all the time this idea of you know he, he goes into the topic of the two through ten where music and what that means is that there are 10 elements to music element number one is the notes and how they interact, and the rest of music. The, all those other elements are, are where the magic happens. Yeah, right? articulation, study, right? phrasing, space, space listening. Space, listening, emotion, yeah. right? And yeah. there's all sorts yeah. of stuff. The periodic table yeah. of Victor's Don't take elements. my word for it. Read them. Oh, thanks, LeVar Burton. <laughs> right? <laughs> but yeah. Reading, put that reading, in the bibliography, oh. too. Yeah, yeah. we quoted. Um, so I think that's uh, all the steps we can think of on how to learn music in in this conversation yeah. and that it's a journey i for myself i i want to be the musical sherpa for my my yeah. you know especially teen to adult students the kids i want to i want to get a little bit of this going on at their you know and you have to engage at their level and at their i i like to just present it till you you see that they regress right 
You say, oh, okay, they're not willing to face this right. fear and yet. Then, okay, we're just going to dial it back. And then spaghetti method. I'm going to try a different approach. Yeah, we're going to come from sticks. this angle. And yeah. then when you see that that regression, okay, we're going back up a little bit here again. Right, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and that, that and way you maintain it. the love of music without right. the fear of music. Yeah. So, well, yeah, I think that's maintain the love of music without, you know, developing it. I like that quote. Yeah, that's a David quote. That's a good, that's your quote. Look that's what my quote. Today. Yeah. Awesome. I'm going to write a book. No, somebody's going to have to write it for me. Yeah, underwriter. That's good. <laughs> Ryan, do you write books? <laughs> no. No. Can't say I do. Do you have yeah. anything to add here, Ryan? We've been talking for a while, and we've been throwing a lot of stuff at you, and you've been taking it all in. I'm sitting back and listening. I'm having a good time. It's a very intriguing conversation. Everyone's journey is so different, right? Mm -hmm. Well, and now listening to what you were saying earlier about your journey, um, I feel like I was in a similar boat, is that I started in um, grade nine at high school playing the trumpet. And I was I was not good. I was genuinely terrible. I, <laughs> I actually started to develop, uh, I didn't like music. I, I, I was scared of it. I, I faked my way through the class. Um, but the goal was, because when I was signing up uh, for courses, I knew that grade nine trumpet would allow me to access grade 10 guitar class. And that, and I didn't think much of it. I just thought it would be if, you know, if I was able to learn a couple songs, that would be worth it. But I faked my way through grade nine trumpet. I would fake playing while everyone else was playing. I would get my friends to read the sheet music for me and put in the valve numbers. And I faked my way through that class, um, got a 70% or something. Nice. And yeah, it worked. Perfect. But then I, I came into guitar, guitar class uh, in grade 10, and I fell in love with it right away. It was really hard at first, and there was it was a group of probably 20 of us, and the teacher did all he could, but of course it's really hard to... Um, teach 20 kids guitar all in one moment, right? So at the end of the day, even though technically I would have had, you know, formal lessons, I guess that's the way I started, so to speak, because I did start in a class. You can kind of say that I did sort of teach myself, but I was given tools by the teacher in this class, which definitely helped. But I did kind of have to figure it out myself. And you guys were talking about, you know, the the pros and cons of learning online almost every the first hundred songs i learned were all through youtube tutorials and i didn't know a single thing about my instrument or like how it worked a lot like what yeah. you were saying i just knew where to put my fingers and i knew i got really good at copying people's fingers and but then at a certain point and you can attest to this dave mm -hmm. you hit a plateau don't you yeah and and you don't know where to go from there. There's only so many songs you can learn off of YouTube. And there's on, only so many good YouTube teachers yeah. <laughs> that actually know what they're talking about. And they'll teach you songs the right way. And you start to run out, out of ideas, right? I don't know what song to, to learn next. And no one's pushing me. And it wasn't until like, shortly before I started working here is that I actually started to understand the mechanics of music and how everything is is formed and it was really like joining you guys that pushed me to do to do that and if that's this we were talking about pros and cons and if I didn't have someone like like the Connors to uh, you know ask questions about hey I did find this video online but John tell me uh, is this right uh, I'd, you know I'd ask him this question and uh, Joe, what do you think about this? I read this online. And the fact that I'm able to bounce those questions off of you guys over the last three years has been greatly beneficial. And I, I don't know, like, it's yeah. everyone's journey is so different. It's very interesting. Like, I learned mostly through YouTube, but then I, I, I hit a plateau and I was really down on myself and I didn't know where to go from there. And then I s basically took lessons with your guys' dad. And then, So you got you got one-on-one -on -one time with... The, the pattern familias with Big Daddy P, <laughs> yeah, with, with the head honcho, yeah. So it's it, fun to sneak on his schedule, eh? So how would you how would you describe lessons with with Paul Connors? <laughs> me me and Paul always joke still to this day. 
pretty much ev every time that he would bring up theory, <laughs> my eyes would just glaze over, right? Because I was uh, 16, 17 at the time, and I just wanted to learn cool songs, right? right yeah. I just I just wanted to impress people with, mm -hmm. with learning how to play this cool impress rock riff. Yeah. He impress the ladies. You know, yeah. <laughs> Let's be fair. A lot of us, especially why, guitar, at six can't... years old, why I chose to learn guitar and yeah. why I quit really quick. I'm like... <laughs> so, but yeah, so you got to, so you, uh, he would, uh, you know, try to gently drop theory opportunities. Yep. Yeah. So, so it sounds like that uh, we've come to an agreement on the concept that you, you eventually put it in a, some sort of bottle like the, and you put it under pressure and create heat. And then you break through that plateau to the next level. So you did it to yourself when you chose grade nine trumpet. You put that self-taughtness under pressure. And then that evolved into putting it under more pressure in grade 10 guitar class. And then that evolved into you being a proficient player to some extent and allowed you to go on YouTube and learn, you know, many songs and get better and better and better. And then you hit another plateau and you were kind of trapped and you thought, well, I better so come take in. lessons better, with better. the professional. Yeah. And then at that point, you put it under pressure again. And then that got you to a certain point. But, you know, like I said, there was an unwillingness to face the fear of theory, of, of structure. And I, for me, and you expressed the same thing. So then it wasn't until we hired you on as a teacher that or like leading up to that and brought you into the umbrella, if you will, or, or the, the bottle of Connor's yeah. music, the the we're in a community and environment where local or non-local people, because we do online lessons, we do uh, in-person lessons, we do hybrid online in-person lessons. There's so many options for you. So that umbrella has gotten bigger, but but we put that contents under pressure again for you. As much as you're willing to face that fear, we're going to put you under pressure. And the more you say yes, the more pressure we'll put you under. <laughs> and then, <laughs> including producing our podcast, <laughs> absolutely uh, for podcast, episode right? one. Here's <laughs> more pressure. And then once again, you step up and you you break through that plateau and you get better and you get better and you get better. I I uh, I, I remember the conversation that Paul had when he uh, brought brought on when he recruited when he recruited oh. Ryan, and it was like this. I got one of these one of my uh, one of my star pupils. I got one of oh, my yeah. guys, yeah. and uh, it was I think early in the pandemic. So I we didn't actually meet you. You you just worked strictly when the store like the store was in lockdown, and so like I'm like yeah I I knew of you, but it was like oh yeah there's this and it was basically Paul's right hand man. That's that's yeah. it was like Paul. I know on Thursdays. Paul has his right hand man, yeah, and his right hand man is Ryan. Yeah, so it's well, it like, fun to have that grow. When you got Connor Bowden on board teaching here, that was right. that, one pupil, of my students, one of your pupils, and, and we've always put him under pressure because that was one of the pressure steps was yep. in their musical journey. And because it's a challenge, you say, yeah. "Hey, if you want to do what I'm doing, do you like yeah. the idea of this?" And, and they we'll say, start "Yeah." With like five and six year olds, yeah, and and, and just and, stay ahead of them. Know, and here's where you're at, and you put yeah. that contents under pressure. And then next minute, he's in the band, and before right. you know it, we're gigging for since he was in high school. I don't know how many years I should long calculate time. it, long, but a long, long time. Long. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and then you just keep building that skill and and that love of music. Right. Um, and then for me, Riley, when he came on teaching here, and uh, he's gone to do other things now in life, still gigging and playing. Yeah. Um, but but it was a base student of mine that you know put him under pressure and say hey yeah. you want to teach here let's try this out and I'm working on another one right now it's, put them I, little, little contents under pressure I always love when we we take these uh, you know these rising star pupils and and watch them watch them grow and say okay you know what have you ever thought about this and I, as a teacher being doing the language of music throughout the week with all the wide variety of students and and instruments and everything that I do accelerated you know, so much like tenfold my, my understanding yep. and, and I'm still on my own journey. Well, you know, it's a funny thing that happened. Uh, it's a very specific event that happened this week for me while teaching a student of mine. Um, we were playing, um, uh, rage against the machine song. Okay, and yeah. there's that little riff that goes da, 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 and with a little trill at the end. And she was struggling to, to get the three event, da, 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 triple, da, triple, uh, yeah. with two fingers alternating, index, oh, middle, index, middle. Yeah, yeah. And I noticed she was going index, middle, middle, index, middle, middle. So instead of going index, middle, index, middle, and, and she was always, the with the she finger. was always leading to the second string with her first finger only. 
right. then I realized in all her playing, it's such a subtle little thing to notice, yeah. always would only lead to a string change with her first finger, never with her second finger. Right. And then I also noticed the same thing, she wouldn't rake down if she already had her finger in place to pluck, she, even though I had shown the rake, it, it kind of, you know, just got pushed oh, to the wayside. Because yeah, you when you're not playing a fast bass line, some of these techniques you can get away without without doing. Yeah. And then I, so we just subtly pointed this little thing out and it made me analyze my own plan. I'm going, oh, how am I doing that? Oh, I'm doing it the way I, I, I taught know. it. But you kind of stare at your own hand going, oh, uh, because right. you just play it. Yeah, you just, how do then I execute like, it? Oh, yeah, let me oh, review my execution. Oh, that's what, that's the difference between what you're doing and what I'm doing and why I'm successful at it and why you're not right now. Not to say you couldn't go right. index, middle, middle and be successful. It's right. just in this instance, I could analyze that and say, here's a little subtlety that makes a big difference. Right. And so, if you're trying to execute instantly, this. Instantly, the feel yeah. was there. And then it was just, now we got to just speed it up. We put it under pressure and we're just going to speed it up a little bit. So uh, One of my students have had for uh, quite some time now, uh, when, whenever we have those moments, we call them the aha. Uh -huh. ah. And and they're my, uh -huh. they're my favorites. They are. I, and, you know, it doesn't happen every week. Sometimes weeks are like coming in. You know, You're going over material or content. This or, is a scale. Yeah, this right. Is How the, to apply is the, you know, but I mean, here's and the he's harmony. like, you know that thing you were trying to show me a year ago? Yeah. It clicked. Aha. Uh -huh. Aha. Uh -huh. and, and and just like eyes are, and it's like, yes. And those are my favorite. Those, I live for those moments as a teacher. Absolutely. I love the ahas. Yeah. So that's awesome. Perfect. All right. Well, I think this is bringing episode one to a conclusion I, I think we covered everything we tried to on the idea of how to learn music right. um next time so, i'll read the assignment correctly so i won't do why to learn music yeah so how. <laughs> right maybe i'll actually email you or write it down maybe. i just told you in passing like yeah, over yeah. lunch by the way joe you're gonna be the guest slash host so co-host yeah, yeah. maybe ongoing host <laughs> um and then so every the second thursday of every month we're going to be putting out an episode as the plan so stay like tuned. subscribe stay tuned um put your comments if you have ideas or experiences put your comments down below uh we would love to read through those and and engage in the ongoing understanding of love and appreciation of music with you so please please just uh engage with us um make sure you check that bell put a like on it because you know, we want you to to get this content when if you're interested in it, if you're appreciating it, we'd love for you to, to see it when it comes out. And uh, and yeah, Heck, you could even if you don't like leaving comments, you could phone us. You can phone us at 905-476-3712. Or visit us at www.connorsmusic.ca. <laughs> Seriously, reach out and we would love to talk to you about music. Wicked. Love it. Cheers. If you love music, then do more than just listen. Connor's music. <laughs>